So um, I've got this talk called Big Data for Real People. Um, I'm going to say right away what real people means. Uh, and it means uh, nobody inside this room. Uh, for the sakes of creating uh, a consumer-facing product, uh, which is built using a lot of data and analytics, um, practically, you don't count to me. I don't design a product for you. Um, because you've either got a big interest in data, uh, a computer science degree, or some kind of big academic degree, or business experience. And you're using a lot of data, and you're used to consuming a lot of data. Uh, and the challenge is, if you're creating a consumer product, is not to create it for you. Uh, so that's only for real people. I'm talking about taking complex issues, a lot of abstract data, uh, and turning it into something which is actually meaningful for the average person uh, and a consumer-facing product, which is, um, which is quite a big challenge. Um, I'm going to go through uh, the challenge I'm currently working on, um, and basically a whole load of, of back history of things I have worked on in the past, and what I've learned uh, by making mistakes, and the lessons I learned in how to visualize data for real people, for people who are outside of this room. So um, just to give you an idea of the scale of the challenge, uh, this is the current challenge I have. Uh, I work at a startup called Alert Me. Probably not really classified as a startup anymore. We've got about 100 people. Um, but we're, we're in that um, sort of connected homes, uh, Internet of Things space. Um, and the Internet of Things is um, it's growing in fashionability. There's lots of stuff out there. Um, we ourselves, you know, we have a platform, got huge amounts of devices started becoming connected to it. Uh, my particular focus at the moment uh, is energy in the home, things that consume energy, um, and how you're metering and paying for energy. That's, that's my particular focus right now. But if you think about the Internet of Things, um, it is essentially just an awful lot of noise. It is a huge amount of sensors uh, streaming out large amounts of data in real time, uh, which could just be something like, window is open, window is open, window is closed, window is closed, uh, which is not really a compelling consumer product. So turning all that information into something which is a service uh, is the challenge uh, I'm currently working on. So um, I spent about five years of my life turning uh, large amounts of data into products. Uh, and I've got a particular background in mapping and visualization. Uh, I'm working a lot with, with various data, various projects, various companies. Um, and actually having a lot of it sort of published in the media taught me an awful lot about um, how, to, how to visualize data, how to, how to abstract all this noise away, uh, and as the cliche goes, find the signal in it, find what's actually valuable to a person. Um, and I've tried to synthesize that down uh, into this very, very simple four rules of visualization. Um, I used to have a whole presentation uh, which was around the, the data visualization of storytelling meme, um, which, uh, which was great. Um, and I think I was either the originator of it or one of the early people pushing that meme. But uh, when it comes full circle three years later, uh, and various agencies are pitching you uh, work using your own meme around data visualization and storytelling, you know, it's time to put it to bed. Um, and this is, this is my attempt to do it. This is where I am right now. Um, it's going to evolve over time and, and probably get added to it. Uh, but four, four very simple rules, which are a framework uh, for visualization. Uh, and turning it into a service or product which is, which is useful for real people. We'll go through examples of uh, specific work, but just a quick run through. Um, personalized, um, if you're creating a consumer facing product, uh, obvious thing, you need, to be, you need to be pulling out the information that is relevant for the customer. Don't, don't throw them a huge amount of data, just the precise information which is relevant to that person in that precise situation. And come back into accessible. Uh, understandable, very easy, simple to read data visualization. I was just in the previous session, uh, which was talking a lot about the art of visualization, etc. Um, I have big problems with nearly all of the visualization you see in the media or press. Uh, I've been part of producing that in the past. Um, the vast majority of it's just not accessible to normal people. Um, if you look at if you look at a graph, for example, of school age and the number of science studies being being taken by those people in school, the graph goes like that, because people are not interested in science, uh, and most people don't want to look at graphs. So a simple rule for accessibility, avoid graphs at all costs. <laughs> um, we'll come back to that. Uh, actionable, um, so what? You know, if you've got all this data, you've got this visualization, if you're not producing something which the consumer can then do with that, then there is no point giving them information in the first place. And instinctive, this is an evolving one for me. Uh, the instinctive one's really quite interesting. By that, 
what I mean is it recognizes human behavior or it recognizes uh, the, the environment that that decision is being made in. Um, prime example is, uh, is this next example, so I'm just going to come straight into that. Um, but we work quite a lot with behavioral scientists to try and understand uh, what motivates people. Uh, and understanding the instinct behind something, the human behavior, um, often actually comes down to talking to people about it. You learn a lot through conversations. I'm going I'm to kick off um, basically going back to the beginning five years ago. So five years ago, um, I was designing uh, real-time analytic systems uh, for Transport for London. Very complex, very interesting field. Uh, huge amounts of data, huge amounts of things moving around at high speed. Uh, that's actually the public transport network in London. You've got trains, buses, um, tube, all that kind of stuff in there. Really, really interesting field. Um, and I got quite interested in what I could do with all this transport data. Um, and I also had sort of one key stat at my disposal was that the average London commuter travels about 40 minutes each way, uh, and they spend 296 hours per year traveling, which is a huge amount of time. Uh, and I was working with uh, quite a few startups around then. Um, and this was the very first product I ever made by myself. Um, it was very original at the time. Um, it was quite advanced for what is now basically a Google Map mashup. Um, it involved a sort of travel time model underneath it all, um, and lots of housing data. But the, the intent was to give somebody a very personal search, uh, a very surfing through a lot of data to them, but saying, you know, if, if you're choosing a place to live, very big decision, uh, various factors involved in that, how much you can afford, where you work, this is all based on travel time. So you say, I work here, um, tell me the most relevant places for me where I can actually find somewhere to live. Um, and we did some things very successfully. Uh, we tried to make some things as simple as possible. Uh, the travel time, a little visualization, very simple. Quarter of the clock, that means about 15 minutes. Half of the clock, that means about 30 minutes. Um, the tube overlay is not that great. Um, but at the time, we used um, custom map cartography to try and hide a lot of the detail that wasn't necessary, try and bring out the data, you know, reduce the noise, get rid of a lot of the data that's not necessary. Uh, there were some things that were, that were really successful about this. Um, on the accessibility scale, uh, the graphs themselves, OK, not that great. Um, but like any budding, budding entrepreneur in the room should be able to have a story about. Um, we launched it, you know, usual coverage in TechCrunch, a bit of fanfare, and nobody used it. Okay. Yeah? <laughs> and the key thing with this is that this didn't understand the instinct. This didn't understand the context, the human behavior around how people search for houses. Um, people search for houses by knowing a place they already want to live in and then by looking into the detail of a particular house or flat or apartment. Most people already know where they want to live, and they don't choose it by commuting. They may, usually you know, the sacrifice you make is the commuting time. Um, so it's so funny if nobody used it. it. It was a great, great example, but um, a big lesson learned there. Unless it fits within the context of how people actually look for property or search for property, then nobody's ever going to use it. Uh, and there's still a few startups making the same mistake today. Uh, so hopefully they'll hear about that sometime soon. Uh, you know, the rest of it worked pretty well. Um, moving on from that, um, I then joined a startup called Eto World. Uh, a lot of the really impressive visuals you'll see are, are the product of Eto World. Um, when I, and if I say I or we, um, I'm always working with a team of people. I've been very privileged to work with some excellent people. Um, so, so a lot of the visuals you see are stuff uh, I did at Eto World as well. Um, and we were we were asked as sort of experts in the field to do some visualization for the start of uh, data.gov.uk when it was first launched. Really um, looking for exemplars. They wanted uh, people to show off to make the data sing, uh, to make it look worthwhile, because there's a lot of doubt in government whether it was actually worth pursuing at that time. Uh, and this is the stuff we did. Um, you know, we tried to tell the story. We were trying to transmit um, what's a very complex subject uh, and frankly, which most people care very little about, uh, and that's you know how a large-scale transport decision or a large-scale uh, transport project could have an impact on a whole city uh, or on your individual life. Uh, and as we lived in London, uh, and there was lots of data available, we, we kind of focused on London, um, and we were trying to show what happened with the congestion charge zone in London, which actually started in 2003. You can see the little yellow box around it. Um, forgive the contrast, it's not great. Um, 2001 is the base year. 
Anything gray means no change, so 2001 should all be gray. Um, anything red is a decrease, and anything blue is an increase. Um, and as you quickly scan through, by the end of 2008, you start to see a lot more red. Uh, and that's, a, that's the decrease of cars and taxis uh, traveling through London. There's a, there's a variety of factors um, at play here, but certainly um, a key thing. And if you look all across London, you see a lot of red. This is a reduction not just within the congestion charging zone, um, but a reduction across the whole of London. Um, and again, we were, we were really focusing on how to try and hide as much detail as possible uh, and make the data really sing. Uh, and this one's perhaps an even more vibrant one. That's, that's the opposite. That's the up, uptake, the increase of cycling. Um, as you see, there's been a massive step change uh, in the way London moves as a city. Uh, all kinds of benefits, uh, some, some kind of problems here and there, uh, but generally a great thing. Um, and, uh, and if you look very closely, um, we have this in the Guardian and other places, um, there are details, a lot of details hidden. And um, when you come in, actually, the, all the tiny roads are still there in grey, the kind of, but pushed way, way back to the background. Um, kind of inspired a little bit by pop art, uh, with these very, very bright colours popping in and out. Um, and this was, this was successful in a way. Um, to a certain audience, um, you know, this, this was gold to a certain audience. Uh, the Guardian loved it. They published it a couple of times. Um, it's in cabinet office white papers. And within that circle of people who are either very interested in policy or very interested in data or interested in visualization, it was very popular. Um, however, outside of that, um, it, it, simply, it simply didn't have an impact. Uh, in, in many ways, you know, we didn't, we didn't achieve what we wanted to do, which was to transmit a, a complex issue to a, a wide, wide group of people. And, and there's big lessons there for people who are interested in data journalism. Um, simply the fact that this is a very limited format when I mean, you're doing this still stuff. Um, you, you can't personalize the content to somebody living down here unless you take it out of this and make it more interactive. Um, so generally a limitation of, of, of where we were. Um, the uptake of this and this project um, was, however, that within that group of people, um, some quite, quite influential and important people got to see the work we were doing. Um, and, and this is what we ended up doing. Uh, by the way, this is OpenStreetMap. Again, this is Eto World stuff. Um, each flash you're seeing there is, uh, is actually a data, a data entry point into the OpenStreetMap database. It's basically a wiki map of the world. Anybody can go in and enter data. Um, and this is the kind of geodata sets we were playing around with at the time. Um, we had some particularly good visualization skills, as you can see. Um, and the reason why it's coming down there is because uh, we got an email from Tim Berners-Lee, um, which is very flattening, but um, also quite, uh, quite, quite scary, actually, uh, to receive an email from the guy who invented the web. You're not quite sure how to communicate with your creator by email. It doesn't come very naturally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there we are. Um, and he said, well, yeah, can, can you create a story for us? Can you, can you create something to visualize um, what I'm trying to say at my next TED talk, uh, which was all about open data, saying, you know, how, can, how can I create a story which people will understand the value of this stuff? Uh, so of course we said yes. Um, and as we were really into OpenStreetMap, uh, this is the story uh, that we came up with. That's Haiti. Um, and as you know, in January 2010, there's a very big earthquake. And again, uh, this is an open street map visualization. All these flashes of people editing it, and you can see there's an awful lot of activity centered around Port-au-Prince. Um, it, it, it was quite a unique event. Um, after the earthquake, uh, search and rescue teams, people from all over the world started arriving en masse in Haiti uh, to attempt to find people, rescue them, and of course, um, you know, rebuild. Uh, however, there was one big problem in that there were no maps on the ground, uh, and if they were, they all dated from the 1970s, uh, which is the legacy of having um, very, very broken uh, leadership and political system. Uh, but it certainly didn't help the people trying to rescue people on the ground. Uh, and the story we tried to tell was, um, was what happened when you know, this, uh, this event happened and how uh, the community of people who, who had an open street map were able to contribute. Um, what you're seeing with that blue stuff the blue glowing things which start to pop out towards the end um, is actually sort of, that's, that's camps of displaced people within Haiti. Um, they were releasing pretty up-to-date satellite imagery. Um, people were able to update and edit in real time uh, this wiki map of, of where people were displaced. 
So uh, you can go and find groups of people who either need help, shelter, or food, perhaps medical aid. Uh, they were also sort of identifying broken buildings, blocked roads, and all that stuff. Uh, and that's what we created. And uh, that went to TED. Um, and, and it looks fabulous. It looks great. Um, but the one thing which, uh, which helped us sort of transmit the story more than, that, more than anything uh, was, that, was that one image there, uh, which I guess is the actionable. That was uh, the one person uh, who, who took a photo in a search and rescue team uh, using that open street map data on their GPS unit as they're trying to navigate around, find people and helping people. It was, um, you know, it was, it was a great key graphic in really bringing it home to people what all that data meant. Um, and, and when we combined the two, um, the thing really, really went quite, quite crazy. People, people started to understand what we were doing with data here. Um, we did TED. That was very nice. Um, it started snowballing, uh, ended up writing an article for The Guardian. Uh, we did the BBC. It was all big news. Um, and finally, uh, we did this feature in, in Wired. Um, and we managed to get, um, you know, that, that, we managed to get, aside from a feature in Wired, <laughs> we managed to stimulate a lot of interest and a lot of talking about this. Um, and the one thing I would say uh, is that it's very important to understand the language of the domain, understand what people are talking about, how their behavior is, how they think about the subject uh, when you're trying to create uh, either a data visualization as a piece, a story, um, or as a product. Um, so that, that's the basis for often where I start with stuff, is, is how do people talk about something? Uh, how do real people do this stuff? Um, and I'm just going to sort of step through what I'm currently working on, which is around energy. So, um, so how do real people talk about energy? Energy is, a, is very abstract. Um, I don't talk about using three kilowatt hours yesterday. I don't talk about this thing uses 200 watts per hour when I have it switched on. Um, it's some things people don't talk about energy. Um, at home, what do I do? Um, I might charge my mobile devices. Uh, I might use my laptop till the early hours of the morning. I watch TV. I might roast a chicken on a Sunday. Uh, people do things. Uh, it's behaviors, it's actions, uh, it's habits, and it's devices that consume energy in the house. So there's no point trying to talk to people about kilowatt hours. You can show them what they've used, certainly. Um, but but this, this discussion about energy needs to start about how people do things. And at the moment, um, this is actually one of my bills. At the moment, um, the only sort of point of conversation uh, you have with a utility company is about three months uh, after the fact, or after three months, you get a large bill. Uh, it's got some pound figures there. Um, it tells you kind of how much you've used, but, but in the reality, you get a bill every three months, um, which is not a great relationship to have with your customers. You want them to be engaged, you want them to be active. You want to understand, after all, where this, uh, where this big pound sign comes from. Uh, and the best part is when the <coughs> explanation of where that big pound sign comes from is another four or five pages of text uh, are, are as part of your bill. So this is really, really not transmitting to me um, how I'm using energy, what's going on in my home. There's, there's no transparency there. You know, how, how do we change that? Um, and we had some really, really interesting experiments uh, looking at human behavior and looking at people. Um, and we work a lot with hardware as well. We're not just software. We do a lot of hardware in the home. Very, very typical, if you can read that. Um, she's known internally as thermostat lady. Um, but she's actually very, very intelligent. Um, her thermostat is so complicated to use, uh, presumably it's got some kind of display with some quite simplistic <coughs> data on it, you would hope, um, but it's so difficult for her to interact with either the hardware or the data displayed on it that to get it to work, she performs a very logical decision, uh, which is putting it in the fridge. That makes the heating goes on. It makes her warm. Perfectly logical. Um, <laughs> However, you can see some of the start of the challenges that we have when, uh, when energy and energy in the home is kind, of, is kind of dominated by engineers. It's dominated by engineers who design and make things for other engineers. It's not really for people. Um, and, and this is how real people talk about using their energy. They're just saying simple things. This is what I do to make me warm. You know, she doesn't talk about, you know, I want to increase it by three degrees. Uh, you know, when I want to be warm, I put it in the fridge. So th we're starting to build up this kind of, this kind of knowledge around the area. Um, and there's a, a very specific opportunity uh, to, to, to add value and to help people understand their energy. It comes from these. Um, if, you're, if you're aware, that's a smart meter. Not very, very exciting. Um, it captures a single reading 
every 30 minutes for both gas and electricity. So you're saying what you've used over the last 30 minutes, uh, which you can put on a display. Um, and it's, to a certain, certain extent, it can be useful to see in real time. You can identify what you're doing. Um, however, this is capturing every 30 minutes. Now, there's going to be two worlds, or well, there are two extremes uh, when it comes to looking at data and sensors and the Internet of Things. And there's one extreme um, where you start from where everything is based on statistics and you can give people a good estimate, a good guess of what we think you're doing, a good guess of how you're using energy. Uh, and the other extreme is where there's a sensor on every single thing in your home. You know how much energy that's consuming. You know how much energy the air, con air condition is consuming. And you can control those things. But we're not at that, that extreme. We're somewhere in the middle. We've got all this data coming out there. Uh, in the UK, there's going to be about 45 million of these smart meters um, by 2019, which is going to generate something about 805 billion data points per year, uh, which sounds like a big number, which is pretty big. But it's quite manageable. Um, but, but how do we actually turn it from just being something which creates a more accurate bill into actually visualizing, creating a personalized experience for people uh, and helps them understand how they're using their energy? Uh, and that's where the data science comes in. So um, forgive me, I do have some graphs, but these are for the sakes of communicating with other people who are interested in data science. Um, so to turn all of that quite bland 30-minute data into something useful, uh, we do have to start with data science. This is something that um, a data scientist in-house have produced. This is a typical household. This is what a typical house would consume in energy uh, across the five sort of big sectors that, that would consume energy in your home. Um, and we've got there by, actually, we do have sensors. So we have sensors in our homes. We have sensors in our engineers' homes. We're monitoring exactly what people are using, how often they use something. And if you have a sensor on something which is very high frequency, for example, you can detect individual appliances. There's a cycle that a washing machine follows. You can detect and pick out and disaggregate that from the data and say, your washing machine's doing this. Um, however, it's not quite, we, we don't all have all those sensors in the home. So we build a model uh, of energy use and how people use energy. Um, and we, we pull in a lot of data from people. We, uh, we have a contract with the customer. Um, that is, and if we ask you for some information, if we ask you for some personal data, it's only for the sakes of providing you with more accurate information about what you're using around the home. Uh, and we then create this quite unique experience. Now, I am at a slight disadvantage uh, in that we have, we have big utility companies to partner with. Uh, we roll out the product with these people. And at the moment, they're not at the stage where they want to go public with the final product. It is being used currently. It's going to go out to about 8 million homes. Um, but I can't, I can't show you the final finished product, which does put me at a distinct disadvantage of showing you how I've made, uh, how I've turned, I mean, this is still very abstract, how I've turned it into personalized, accessible information. Uh, I can show you some of the mistakes we made along the way uh, of early prototypes uh, and things we did. So I'm just going to focus on that, but I can't show you the final thing just yet. Maybe I can come back and show you another time. Um, but this is a very early one. This was, I think, the first proof of concept and prototype we did. Chris, could you just note that if you're rolling something out to 8 million homes with a large energy provider, are they focusing on reducing bills or increasing their efficiency? What is the business driver for them? Um, so the utility world and market is actually low margin. It's about 4 or 5%. That's not going to change. It's constantly going to be whatever the, basically whatever the wholesale market decides. On top of that, you're going to make four or five percent. Um, as I said, there's quite a lot of churn. That point often comes when people move houses or they get a large bill. Um, if your sole interaction with a utility company is to, not with them, but with on compare the market to find which one will reduce your bill, that's a that's a poor pace, place to be in terms of stopping churn and retaining customers. So uh, there's a couple of drivers. One is definitely churn, retaining customers. Um, but also, um, a lot of utilities really, really want to come into this connected home space. Um, they don't want to just be selling you gas or electricity. They also want to be providing you with other services as well um, in, the, in the home. So, so that, that's where utility companies are. Um, but on this one in particular, this was an early prototype we did. Um, this is actually before, before I was working on this. Um, as you can see, we've just done a very simple high-level breakdown of what's going on in your home. Um, you can actually see some big problems with this straight away. Uh, there's a time and a place 
for pie charts, uh, and that's in Microsoft Office. And they should never leave Microsoft Office or PowerPoint or Excel, um, because there's a big cognitive gap, uh, which and jumps basically that people, mental jumps that people have to jump through to get mental hoops people have to jump through to get there. Uh, so first of all, uh, I have to look at this. So this color, okay, that color, that's hot water. Okay, I see that. Um, I can see individual prices over there. I can see a total price there. Uh, am I supposed to visually work out that this one is just a little bit bigger than that one? Um, pie charts, universally, whenever I've gone through unit, te unit testing, have tested very, very badly. Uh, in fact, there's some anecdotal evidence from, from another startup when they, when they tested people uh, using pie charts. They, they, they said, you know, well, what do you think? And they said, I never really saw myself as a pie chart type, pie chart type of person. Uh, and you see, you get out there, people, people, it's just difficult to read it. Um, actually, very, very low value, very low value visualization. However, on the right hand side, what you actually have is a, a perfectly formed hierarchical visualization, which is a list. Uh, and people read lists and process them very, very easily. Um, so, on top of that, that pie chart adds very, very little value. However, you can do very nice things with. With hierarchical lists, you can produce obviously a nice visualization to, uh, to pull that out. Funny enough, you'll see that in, in our finished article. Um, but actually, the, the list is funny enough one of the best visualizations you can do. Immediately accessible. This, this is not accessible in any way, shape, or form to normal people. So uh, I'd avoid pie charts at full stop. So on this, on this accessibility note, I'm just going to show you uh, show another thing we put into testing. Um, and the feedback we got on this. So this is one thing we put into testing. Um, now, if you're, if you're familiar with business intelligence, and most of you are, this come, the language of the domain, this comes right out of the business intelligence language domain. You've got a dial there, you've got a graph there, you've got a horizontal chart, you've got a pie chart down there. Four different ways of visualizing data. Um, and funny enough, people got very, very confused by this. Tested very, very badly. Uh, and the thing that highlighted it, really, really highlighted it for me uh, when we reviewed the user feedback, is that five out of six, five out of six people in this round of user testing all said the same thing. What is a dashboard? The first requirement you will receive when you work on a project around data visualization as a product is we want a dashboard. It's the first guarantee is the first requirement you'll receive on a dashboard. Because we're talking in the language of business intelligence, language and domain. People talk about dashboards. Nobody in the consumer market, in the real world, real people, talks about dashboards. They don't know what it is. And they don't want graphs. And they don't want dials. They want a very, very personalized, accessible experience. Again, I can't quite show you the final one, which is really quite upsetting, because it is out there. It is out there in people's hands, but we're, 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 not, we're not publicizing it at the moment. Um, but I just want to show you a show you one thing um, about making accessible data. Actually, very, very hard to do, uh, very complex. Um, and some would say, you know, quite boring and quite dull. Um, but one of the simplest ways of bringing together a lot of complex data, a lot of abstract notions, um, and synthesizing it to tell to somebody uh, is actually to put it into a sentence. Uh, it was actually quite hard, technically. Yeah, I'll let you go away and do that stuff. Um, but this is the kind of stuff we're, we're actually doing uh, with people's energy data. We're looking at your data, telling you, making it immediately personable. You, your boiler. We can see it, actually. We can see what's going on. We're not gonna, we might show you a graph. You could look at a graph if you want to. We just say, look, you know, look, we can see it. Your boiler's on all the time. That means you've got a pilot light. That is costing you this. So immediately personable. Um, we provide an action with all of these things, you know, swap it out. If you, if you replace that boiler with a new one, that would save you £120 per year. Um, other stuff. Um, we're looking at your lighting, we're looking at all this stuff. This one's really interesting, actually. Um, I just want to come back to the instinctive point in my list. Uh, we do quite a lot with behaviour scientists. Uh, behavioural scientists are an interesting bunch. Um, it's something which is quite new to me. Uh, coming from a very technical background and, and not, not necessarily really really wanting to get involved with academia that much. But um, behavioral science taught us a lot. Um, if you look at just the difference in the word, um, wastes and save. Um, lots of user testing, lots of looking at personas. 
we, uh, we started off with a heavy emphasis on savings, telling people in a product how we can save you money. We can save you money. Um, what the behavioral science told us, and user testing confirmed, is that simply changing that save to waste, it's the top one, you're wasting 120 pounds a year. You're wasting a big, big increase in difference. People, people got that, actually. Very interesting. I think it could be particular to, uh, to you know, uh, a part of the country or Europe. You probably have to come up with something completely different in another co cultural background. Um, but there's something about the cultural makeup of Northern Europe that hates wasting money. If you tell them you could save 20 quid uh, every three months, nobody really cares because, well, if you're quite comfortably off. Nobody, frankly, cares about saving 20 quid. If I've got to go through all this palaffle, turning stuff off to save 20 quid, do I really care? If you're telling people they're wasting 120 pounds per year, they go crazy. People are like, I must stop this. I must stop this. Uh, the, the, the difference in behavior is incredible. Um, so that's one thing we've learned by working through behavioral science. So, so just, to, just to sum it up, um, that's the little rules I have. That's the framework. Kind of working on it, the instinctive one is very new to me. Um, it's a field which is growing within data science. Uh, hopefully I'll come back some other event and I can talk through this stuff. Um, but yeah, personalized. If it's a consumer product, it has to be about them. It has to be very, very relevant to them. Also, it has to be worthwhile. If it's about saving 10p a month, forget about it. Don't even bother showing it to them. Accessible, basically no graphs. Uh, it, might be, it might be a bit of an, an effort to people in the room, but try and... We, we, there's a time and place for graphs, and we do have them in one place in the product. So that's where we leave them. The rest of the stuff, we try and stay away from graphs as much as possible. Actionable, you're giving somebody an insight, you have to give them something to do about it. If there's no call to action, something to do about it, there's no point giving them the information. And instinctive, uh, look at how people talk about something, look about the, the environmental context that people are in when they're, when they're looking at information or they're making these decisions, performing these tasks. Um, and behavioral insight is uh, something to really pay attention to. So I'll just, just wrap up with one little thing. Um, the next challenge for us, in particular my team, um, is to deal with all this noise. Uh, the internet and th in things, there's these you know, big stats on the right hand side. People like Cisco love telling you there's going to be 15 billion interconnected devices by 2020, whatever it may be. Um, it's creating a huge amount of noise, an awful lot of data flying around. Uh, and the thing is, it, it's already happening. You know, we have this platform. All these devices are sold by a, by a partner in the States. They're selling these pieces of kit. And the challenge is quite phenomenal in that all these devices are going to be out there. They're all going to be connected. They're all communicating in real time. Uh, and the number of devices is growing exponentially. So the challenge in the Internet of Things, very much finding the signal amongst all of that noise. And um, maybe I'll come back sometime and tell you all about it. That's me. <laughs>